Hi, Cedric here from Art on Main, back with another art video. And because I'm sure that you're tired of staring at this old mug, I got one of my dear friends, Britton Ann Mulman from Art on Target, to take us through the basics of Alla Prima painting. Enjoy it. Remember, the store is open. Come and support us. See you soon. Welcome to Art on Target. Art on Target is a place where children, scholars and adults can participate in classes. We do classes that are informal as well as formal classes that prepare students for tertiary institutes and beyond. Um, we like the idea of taking you through the various languages of art and we would love to share this with you. So today we're going to take you through the journey of doing an Alla Prima painting. An Alla Prima painting is really about doing a painting from beginning to end in one session. Why? It's really good practice and it will also introduce the process of going from general to specific. Working from big brushes to small brushes, thin paint to fat paint and you will thoroughly enjoy this process. With doing an Alla Prima painting, you need a subject. The best thing is to use something that is available in your kitchen. Today we are choosing to do leeks and we will be painting the leeks on a canvas sheet. It's important to prepare the canvas sheet because they are absorbent. So you would use gel medium or acrylic paint, seal the canvas off and um, wait for that to dry really well before you start painting. So we want to get going with the painting, right? But in order for you to get going with the painting, you need some equipment. Your first set of equipment is your palette knife for number 12, full bit brush, some round brushes, number 7s and number 5s, and then really fine brushes, number 0. And your first set of paint that you're going to work with is your translucent primaries, which is Indian yellow, cyan blue, and magenta red primary. Those three colors you will use initially before you introduce any whites. You also will need to make up a glaze medium, which you can use Zilkin or Liquin with genuine turpentine in the separate container, working it as a 40-60 principle, and you will need turpentine to clean your brush. A cloth is ideal for wiping your brush after cleaning, and cleaning your palette or your palette knife, you would use toilet paper. And that pretty much sets up your studio environment that you require for this Anna Prima. And I can't wait to start this with you. Right, so what we're into making first is an orange. So we're taking Indian yellow, beautiful color, nice and rich. It really has an orange vibe to it. So then we're going to add a bit of magenta. You can see that that looks more of a yellow orange right now. If you added blue to that, you would get very much a green. That's not what we're after. So we want to be able to strengthen that orange to more of a red orange. And slowly, you can see that I'm adding tiny bits at a time because pigment is strong. And you need to be careful with regards to how much you add to start with. Look at that, you'll see that the initial tone is green, but as we go towards the orange, we will get more of a brown tone coming through. Which means that the blue and the orange have neutralized each other. Right, 
so you have prepared your surface with gel medium or acrylic, it's nicely dry and you're ready to go. You've made your neutralized brown and at the moment that hasn't been diluted because remember we're working from thin to fat, diluted paint to non-diluted paint. So the first process is to add some of your gel, I mean, glass uh, medium and mix that well with your palette knife so it's nice and even. Um, and what you're after is to cover the surface but you want to not overwork your brush stroke so when you're adding this allow your brush stroke to just go onto that surface nicely um, you can obviously overwork it in various ways if you do this you're going to end up with a very flat uh, process um, look um, so I would suggest you rather just brush it through but if you feel like you need to put it on quickly, then you can do that and brush it off afterwards. Um, this process is very much a wet on wet. And one of the things you have to be really careful of is overworking your surface. You can see as well that when you load your brush, you'll end up with a darker tone. When your brush hasn't got much paint on, you'll end up with a thinner area. What's interesting about this particular process is that you can develop textures, you can work things like an earbud and make lines and textures if you want to develop something at the bottom. Um, let's say you're exploring that idea and you don't really like it, you can just go back to covering the surface again with your brush, you know, to get an even finish. So there's a couple of choices there. One, your brush can create texture if you like, uh, you know, to emulate a sort of, a sort of feeling of a wood panel. Um, or you can use an earbud to pick up lights and create striations um, because uh, you're working with very wet paint right now. Or you can be working with a cloth and scrunch up your cloth and dab to create texture. Let's say that you've overworked the texture a little bit, well you have the opportunity to come back with your brush and manipulate that surface so that it's not as texturally loud. If you don't like it at all, well, your paint isn't an eraser. You can just erase everything and you're back to where you started. Okay, so the, this part of the painting is excavating where you're literally using no paint, you're actually taking paint away. Um, but before you do that, you're going to look at your subject matter and decide how you want to compose it on your surface. If you do it too close to the edge, you're going to end up with a lot of negative space at the top. So the idea is really to place it quite carefully. And if you look at that triangle shape there, it's already been suggested in the surface area there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that main leak as my departure point and pop that little mark in there as an indicator of that main leak. Now you can see what happens is as I'm moving the paint it's creating an edge. I dry the brush off. I can remove that edge if I want to. And with this I can start manipulating the kind of brushwork and surface area that I want to create that leak to be in. Um, and you would continue to do so until you've got the basis of your subject. Now we still not take, we're not extracting it to the point of having serious whites, which we'll do only once we've got the base of the composition in place. Um, you don't want to be introducing turpentine too quickly because it will dilute your paint out. So we're just getting a base idea here of what is happening with the fronds or the leaves and where the, the um, leaks, the white part of the leaks are. Once you've got the base of that, remember it's general, you're moving to specific. Then you can dip your brush into turpentine, dry it off relatively well and go from the area that you want the lightest to be because it's going to pick up the major part of the paint. And you can clean away the paint where you want the white components of the leaks to show.
So the next stage is to work the green leaves in and you really want to make three different types of greens. Your yellow green to start with, your mid green and then a shadow green. So the basis of green is really using your yellow and blue. So again you want to be careful with how you mix the blue because it's a really potent colour. So rather use little bits at a time and slowly get there than try to just bomb it in in big lumps. Um, it's going to help to just see it very subtly. So that would be your yellow green right over there. Um, that's your first green. Now obviously you've got that as an example so it's easy for you to look at the next green in relation to that one. You'd obviously use a lot more blue um, and you would make that a deeper green compared to the one above and it's much easier to see if you have the sample of the one above. So here we go, we go a bit deeper. At the moment you can see it's pretty much the same um, and as we add the blue it will go more green than the one above. Right. And then the next green is a shadow green, but in order for you to do the shadow green, you have to neutralize the green. So what you're after is making the same green that you just did. Um, we're using the yellow and blue, making a dark green. But to neutralize the green, you have to use red. And you would use a tiny bit of red to start with. And you'll see that it goes almost black if there's too much red and as you put the red into the green it will neutralize it out. Um, probably needs a little bit more. Um, and you can see that that green is far more of a shadow green compared to the one above. So as you can see, the yellow green is related to the part of the stalk closest to the actual leaf bulb. The mid green is more related to the leaves that you see on the surface and the shadow green is related to the leaves in the shadow of the leaf. Um, bearing in mind that when it is lumped like this, it looks really dark, but you'll be painting with it in a very thin tone because we're adding the glaze medium. So we're going to use the glaze medium that we made earlier using Zalcon and uh, Genia Turpentine. And we don't want to pour it straight in, we want to be able to define how much we use, so just pour some on the edge. And the best way to work with this is to dip your brush straight into the glaze medium and then into the paint. So we're going to start with the yellow green to uh, first. Because you can imagine, it would be very difficult to go to the yellow green if you're starting with the shadow green. And actually pull your brush from the far end of the front forward. Um, and you can, you can actually define the size of your brush by twisting. Uh, and you can get a really good stroke of that leaf. You don't need to be, you know, overworking it. Just look at your subject matter and find those leaves as you see them. Um, we are doing an Alla Prima. We are not doing a 16th century Renaissance painting. Um, and so it goes. And once you've added whatever you feel is necessary on the light green. Remember you have the option to use the flat of the brush to make big strokes and twist to get thin strokes. Alright, so that's enough on that one. Right, so we're going to go to the next green. Mix it into that so you've got a little bit of transition colour. Um, and again, don't have too much glaze medium because otherwise it would be too thin and then go in next to that. Sometimes those uh, leaves will have a dark edge to them so you might want to add that in. And it's just really using the edge of your canvas as a way of delivering the paint and pulling it in from there. Um, because that part you're going to pull off in any way.
Unfortunately, at this stage, if you make a mistake, sorry for you. Let's say for argument's sake you've put the dark green in the wrong place. The only way you can get rid of it is by pulling it away. No amount of new paint or more paint is going to get you any closer to where you were. You need to get back to excavating the surface to be able to correct that mistake. And obviously, um, you know, that in itself will allow you to manipulate from there. Right, so you have the bases of the leaves of the leek with the yellow green and the mid green. So now we're going to work the shadow green again. Pick up your glaze medium, go into your shadow green. Remember, this is much darker and more intense. So you want to be able to kind of manipulate this in between um, the other fronds so that they literally stick out, you know, giving you a sort of a 3D effect. And you notice that I keep um, adding more paint to my brush because ultimately I'm also pulling off paint. Okay, you also see that I'm still working with a very fat brush at this stage. I have not moved to a smaller brush. Um, I'm still on the original brush that I started with. So for me that is doing what it needs to do to create that bunch. Um, so the next phase is to go into the shadows of the leaks and the shadows of the leaves onto the table or the wooden board. Right, so we're going to look at putting the shadow tones in. Um, there's an SS2 types of shadows that are occurring. The very, very dark shadow that is directly under the leaf and then it goes slightly lighter when it's away from the object. So we want to make two browns. In essence, the brown that we can make with the dark green is already our shadow brown. So I'm just collecting that into one pile. Um, I use toilet paper for cleaning a palette knife, but not for brushes. Um, and then the yellow green will make your lighter brown. So by adding red to that, you'll see that we'll end up with pretty much a similar brown to what we started with. Um, well, yes, in essence. Um, But that has got more of a yellow tone to it. Needs a bit more red. Start to green. Uh, there we go. You can see that that's got more of a yellow tone to it because of the yellow green value. Okay. If we add the red to this dark green, we're going to actually end up with quite a dark tone that is going to be almost a black brown. Um, bit more. Bit more. Maybe even more. Um, let's go for that. And there we go. Can you see that that is much deeper, more shadowed than the one before? This is closer to a black brown compared to this one, which is more a yellow brown. Right, so applying the shadows, again it's about observing where they are. You're just not randomly putting them everywhere. You've got your light source coming from the right hand side, so the shadows are falling more to the left. Um, and you want to go for the mid brown first in the gentler areas. Notice I'm using a much smaller brush than I was using before. And again, I've only got one opportunity to apply this. 
I can't overwork that surface. So this is a residue shadow. It's not sitting right on the um, leak. It's above the leak. So I'm just gently putting that in there. Um, and in comparison, that one as well. Just a little bit of marks, just giving it a little bit of depth. Um, and in essence, giving it a place for it to rest on the, on the um, breadboard. Um, whereas, this front leak shadow is much darker, so we're going to go into that darker tone. And we'll pretty much pull it in from the edge, work it in, twist your brush, and just let it slide and kind of make your mark, you know, that way. If you feel that it's too heavy, you can take the paint off your brush, run next to it, and just pull the paint a little bit so that you're not losing any of those lumps as such um, and with that same dark color you might want to indicate a little bit of shadow in between the leaves uh, here and there just to give a sense of depth um, you know I see for example that there's quite a strong shadow there so I'm going to pop that in and work that in there and there's a little bit of a strong shadow here Um, you notice that I made a mistake. Well, how do I deal with that? Pick it up. Pick it up with your earbud. Because if you try to paint that, you are going to end up with a gush. And you can use a brush that has got no paint on and just sort of rectify um, to help you to resolve that particular area. Right, so you can, you can carry on with the dark shadows to reinforce some of the areas. Remember you're delivering paint, so you want to be able to make sure that your brush is working for you on that level and you just deliver the paint. It's very much a wet on wet process. And you've got to be really careful that you don't overwork it, so I think I'll stop right there. Right, so we're going to use a number two brush, a soft hair, for the excavation of the roots. And initially, you're not going to put it into turpentine. And bear in mind, if you touch your canvas, you're going to mark it. So use your little finger and just pull away where you think more or less the roots are going to be. What you're trying to do is get rid of some paint by pulling it away. And use a cloth to to dry the brush, so just taking a little bit of the paint away in that area to lighten it up. Then dip it into turpentine, uh, dry it off a little bit and become a little bit more precise about your, your uh, root area. And dry in between so that you're developing those roots, you know, slowly because it is a integral part of the leak, but you don't want it to be a blob. Uh, which is why you do it carefully um, and this way you are more in control of creating a particular root structure for the leak. So remember there's, there's shadows in between but you're not doing the shadows, you're pulling the whites out of the actual roots first just because you're pulling the paint away, we also call that excavation. Um, it is a lovely process to work with when you're working wet on wet. Um, and also what it allows for is that when you're putting your lights on, that you're not going to be blending with what is already there. It looks like I need to make this a lot bigger. So let me just take this root area a little bit bigger. Right. I think that's pretty much the desired effect.
So we want to add some shadow into the roots. You don't want the dark, dark shadow. That's not going to work so well. So you work with a light shadow using the same brush. And just gently come in between the roots to just give it a sense of 3D. You know that there's a bit of shadow falling here and there. Just going to add another dimension to those roots um, and give it a sense of uh, three-dimensionality. Um, you will be working lights over this, but it basically will add a whole other dimension um, to those structures because fundamentally it is such a part of leeks or spring onions. And the best way to deal with uh, your subject matter so that nobody compares your painting with your subject matter in the future is to make a lovely potato leek soup then your evidence is gone. So the next stage is really to deal with the opaques. You're working with the highlights and the lighter tones. Um, and remember the whole process is from thin to fat. So at this stage you've been working with the glaze medium a lot and now you'll be working with a lot less of the glaze medium where the paint will be sitting more on the surface. So opacity really is created by the application of white to any color but you do have other colors like cadmium yellow and lemon yellow that have opacity already uh, lemon yellow a whole lot less than cadmium yellow but you in essence need those three so what that's going to do is give us a variety of light limey greens for the uh, leek as well as the stalk part I've kept the brown glazes here because I might be needing some of that just to tone the greens down a bit because some of the greens can get quite acidic. Right, so the first yellow you want to use is lemon yellow. On its own with side blue is really acidic. I mean it, it's more of a turquoise than it is a green. Um, by adding more lemon yellow, you can see at this point in time it's not really relating to the um, leak at all because it's too acidic by adding a little bit of Indian yellow you're going to get closer to it um, and you see that I don't add it into all of it because I want to see where I left behind where I left that color behind and then by adding some white to that gradually you'll see that that sort of leaky green color is coming out quite beautifully yeah. So the, the green after this, which is really, this is close to the bulb of the leek. The green after this is really into the leaf. So we want to make something similar, but it's got to be a little bit greener. So we're starting with the same base of lemon yellow and cyan blue, getting that acidic green. Just a little bit blue at the moment. Um, adding the Indian yellow to that. Getting to that same place that you were before, but now you need to add some of the cadmium yellow to give it a little bit more bite, a little bit more solidity. And again, it's still a bit too limey, so I'm going to add a touch more of the cyan. And that green is taking me a little bit deeper into the leaf. If I add a tiny bit of white to that, you'll see what I mean. Uh, it's less yellow and more leafy in tone. Right, so we want to work with the creamy tone of the leek bulb, but we also want to work with that pure white. That pure white isn't a pure white, it's white with a tiny bit of cadmium yellow, like literally minute amount you want to make a cream. So just leave that to the side because that's a reference for you. Um, and then we want to make some of the shadow version of that. So you're using the white again with the cad yellow. But it's too acidic on its own. So this is where your brown becomes important. You're just going to take a little smidgen of that to neutralize that out. To push it a little bit more to an earthy tone. That's going to help you with the shadow side of the leaks. That would be the highlight.
One thing I must say is that when you're mixing colors, some, some people have the tendency to just bomb all the colors together and what you lose in the instance of that is those lovely tonal variations that are occurring right there. Um, if you bomb it together, you're never going to see that. So that's actually what I'm after. When I'm picking this up, I'm going to end up with that tonal variation on my brush um, without overworking it. Right, and when you apply that, you're going to end up with those sort of tonal variations occurring right into the painting. Um, again, if you're too dark, you're working with opaque, so you can just brush it in from the lights, you know, and slowly sort of develop it from there. Um, and remember, you're picking up paint as well, so you don't want to be uh, too too conscious of um, overworking here without picking up there from your palette. If you feel that it's too blue, you can always, always add a little bit of Indian yellow to make it less blue. Um, so I'm going to add that in there, pull that in there a little bit. One thing I want to show you is that when you go in there and you go all the way, what you're ending up with is what was left on there. If you take that into your paint, you will end up with what they call kaput mortum, which is a dead color. So as you're going, you can be adding, you know, all that information as you go, being able to give your leak more and more detail. But bearing in mind that if you're going from there, let's say your front is very light and you're pushing it all the way into the dark area, you're actually picking up all the paint that is there. And if you bomb that straight in there, it's going to end up killing the color because of all the other colors that are there. So you've got to be very careful, rather clean your brush between those stages. Okay, so I feel that there's more of a yellow green in the foreground of these uh, leaks. So I'm going to just explore that a little bit. Going a little bit more of a yellow green here. Um, again, did you notice no glaze medium involved in this process at all? So I'm just going to explore that a little bit in there. Um, again, I've picked up that paint, so I don't want to be adding that. Um, and a little bit in that one. bit in that one. Uh, maybe a little bit more yellow, white in this foreground one. Okay, you've seen that I've taken that green far down where in actual fact it doesn't exist so far down in the um, leak itself. So to remove it's cleaning your brush of turpentine, drying it off and excavating that color so that you don't mix it with whatever is on top. Right, so that's in a nutshell how that is done. Um, to get to the bulb of the leak, you're going to work with the shadow color first. And you're going to add that shadow color, it's actually quite bright. But you're going to add that shadow color in where you think you need it. Uh, just giving the leak a little bit more information. Not the roots, because the roots is a fine brush. Um, and once you've done that, you can go to your highlight color. So when you're working with your highlight of the leak, look for the light source where it's the lightest. And with a single brush, just bomb it in. Um, don't belabor this too much, uh, because you are working a wet on wet situation. Once you've done that and you want to blend it, take it to the other side and push it into the rest of the paint. Uh, you'll get all sorts of design effects that way. Uh, and now we're going to look at putting some highlights into the roots. Okay. All right, so we're going to work with the roots now. We, we want to highlight the roots just like we've highlighted the bulb. But we're using a small brush, which is like a two or a one. 
Generally, they have the tendency to backload. When you over apply, you'll see that you're ending up with backloading. You're going to avoid that. Um, so the best is to use a bit of glaze medium. Just get some onto the initial hairs of the brush. And all brushes are not great. And then just tweak, you know, the odd root to kind of give a sense of 3D to be able to give it a little bit of dimension that this leak actually exists on your painting. I'm going to pull that highlight in a little bit more. So as you see we went from a very fat brush to a really thin brush and so we are adding more and more information. Right, at this opportunity, which is near the end, you've put in your highlights, your roots, your shadows, you've got your different greens in the leaves. You have the opportunity to do a final little um, sort of manicurial fix. If you can see, there's a particular issue around that one. So I'm going to work with the shadow tone because I did save some of that brown. So I'm going to work with that and I'm just going to pop that in just to give it a little bit more definition of shadow to allow for that leak to make more sense um, and I can work that in a little bit um, and almost do a rectification but one of the issues about an under prima is that it's a painting from beginning to end wet on wet if you have made massive mistakes it's rather better for it to dry and you have to do the corrections once it's dry so now we are going to pull off the masking tape so that you can see what the final image looks like without the messy bits on the side. Um, and this is such a rewarding part because it does give you the feel of the final product um, without the messy studio environment as such. 